So it's Friday night, and I want to take a break from politics and recommend a Friday night movie for you to watch. Granted, you could watch this any night. You don't even have to watch it at night. And you could watch it on a Saturday night or a Sunday night. It doesn't really matter. But it's Friday night now, so I'm calling this the Friday night movie. Um, the movie I'm going to recommend is an older movie that I watched last night for the first time in a long time. It's a 1978 film called Coma. It was directed by Michael Crichton, who went on to become famous for Jurassic Park. And it's based on a novel by a writer named Robin Cook. And um, it's a really entertaining film. And it's a little bit of a period piece because it's 1978. And so when you're watching it, you're, you can't help be struck by the lack of cell phones and other forms of current technology in the movie. So actually, that brings me to something else. So before I even get to the movie, I want to talk to you a little bit about 1978. Because I remember 1978. I was eight years old in 1978 when this movie came out. So for anybody who wasn't there, I want to tell you about it. And if you were there, you'll get a kick out of this because you'll remember some of the stuff that I'm talking about. So back in the 70s, um, I had a great aunt and great uncle on my father's side who owned a beach house. And we would go and visit them in the summer. And this is what life was like in 1978. Um, this beach house was like old school. You know, it didn't have like proper winter insula uh, insulation. You could only go there in summer, really, even though it had a fireplace. It really wasn't built for um, living there in the wintertime. So we would go and visit them in the summertime. And uh, there was one phone. It was a landline mounted on the wall. So if you wanted to talk on the phone, you had to sort of stand near the phone on the wall. They had one small black and white television, which got three channels on a good day. You know, I mean, and back then in 1978, uh, your choices were limited anyway, because there was no cable TV. Um, and you couldn't even like say, well, at least we can pop in a, a movie. You couldn't even do that because there were no VCRs. There were no DVDs. There was nothing like that yet. So um, you were lucky if you got three channels on a good day. And back then, a little TV like this had two dials, one for VHF channels and one for UA UHF channels. VHF channels were channels 2 through 13. These were your network television channels. So this was ABC, CBS, NBC, and usually at least one PBS station. Um, and you might have another sort of community station thrown in there as well. Um, and you were lucky if, you know, if you were out in a remote area like where this beach house was on Cape Cod, you were lucky if you got, you know, one or two channels. Three would be great. Four would be amazing. And that's on the main dial. Then on the UHF channel, which is where you got smaller independent and local stations, so on Cape Cod, the local UHF stations were in Boston. And those were channels like Channel 56, Channel 38, Channel 25. And uh, there was a PBS had a, had a smaller local station too, which was Channel 44. And um, usually we were able to get at least one of these. I think the channel that came in the best was Channel 56 in Boston. So if you were lucky, you might get like some Star Trek reruns or some sitcom reruns or some old cartoons, like some Bugs Bunny cartoons. And then uh, maybe on a Saturday night, you could watch like Love Boat and Fantasy Island. Or on Sunday night, you could watch like something like 60 Minutes or a news show. But that was about it. I mean, you weren't there to watch television anyway but your television options were extremely limited. Um, we had radio, there was a radio, um, 
And the other thing that there was a lot of was books. So my great aunt and my great uncle, because they spent a lot of time in this beach house, they had a lot of books, mostly novels. Because this is something that, you know, if you didn't have TV and, you know, your other entertainment options were somewhat limited, this is what people did back then. You read books. Um, I know people still read books today, but people read books much more frequently back then when it was one of the only options for entertainment. So they had a lot of novels lying around. And one of the novels that I remember seeing sort of lying around in this house was the Robin Cook novel, Coma, which this movie is based on. And the reason I remember it is because it had a very striking image on the cover of a person's body uh, sort of lying on its back, but suspended from wires. It's a very striking image and when you're a kid you see something like that it sort of makes an impression on you and you don't forget it so when i watched this movie it really took me back because it, it reminded me of this image from the cover of the novel coma and uh just reminded me of how different life was in 1978 and how far we've come in terms of technology and uh, when you watch this movie, it's, it's, it's impossible to escape. So now I'm gonna talk about the movie. So if you haven't seen it before and you want to see it, uh, you should stop now because I am going to ruin the whole thing. Major spoilers ahead, okay? All right, so here we go. So the film centers on a young couple, a man and a woman, uh, especially the woman. Her name is Dr. Susan Wheeler. She's a young, surgeon working for a fictional hospital in Boston called Boston Memorial Hospital. One of her best friends goes into the hospital for an abortion, undergoes anesthesia, which apparently was necessary in those days. And when the procedure is over, they can't wake her up. And the young woman who's like in her twenties ends up in a coma. So the main character, the doctor, realizes that this is very suspicious for a healthy young woman to go into a coma. And she starts looking into, um, she starts sticking her nose in places where it doesn't belong. And she finds out that the hospital has an unusually high number of patients who go into comas following surgery. And she brings this to her boyfriend, who's played by Michael Douglas, and he's on his way up the ladder at the hospital, so he doesn't want to make waves. So he kind of dismisses her concerns and reminds her that, you know, she has a job to do and that she shouldn't be wasting her time on this and all that. Um, but anyway, she continues looking into this. Well, one day later, another patient at the hospital played by Tom Selleck, of all people, who is this healthy young man, went into the hospital for like a routine, really routine, mundane form of surgery on his knee. And the next day, she finds him in a coma. And now she's like, really, she's almost in a panic at this point. And uh, she keeps investigating. Um, eventually, the news of her investigation makes it back to the chief of surgery at the hospital, who's an older guy, um, and his name is uh, Dr. George something, I forget. Um, anyway, he's kind of upset because he's angry that she's been sort of investigating the hospital. You know, she works there. And he's like, you know, what are you doing? But he also understands that her friend just went into a coma. And also in the ensuing amount of time, her friend who went into a coma has died. So now the young doctor is very upset because not only did her friend go into a coma, but her friend has passed away. So the chief of surgery takes pity on her and says, listen, I realize you're upset about your friend. Take the weekend off, go walk on the beach, get your head together, come back on Monday and we'll pretend like nothing ever happened. So that's exactly what she does. She and her boyfriend, Michael Douglas, go to some beach somewhere 
and there's a few scenes of them sort of walking on the beach and you know playing in the ocean and and uh, all that. And then they're in his car and he's driving, and they're presumably driving home from some place on the North Shore or maybe on the coast of Maine. And they're driving back into Boston, and they pass a sign that says Jefferson Institute, and this sparks both of them. It sparks both of their curiosity because in her investigation about the comas, what she's found is that many of the people who end up in comas at this particular hospital get sent to some place called the Jefferson Institute, which is supposedly like a long a long term care facility for people in a coma. So she convinces um, her boyfriend that they need to investigate. And she goes there and they go there and it's this big concrete building that looks like there's like no one there. You know what I mean? It's this big concrete building with all these windows and it's sort of modern looking for the 1970s. Um, but there's like no cars and there's no people around. And it's very strange. So Michael Douglas stays in the car and the young doctor, the young woman goes up to the front door and walks in where she's met by a nurse. And, um, she says, you know, can I, what is this? I know I've heard of this place. Is it all right if I come in and take a look around? And the young nurse says, well, uh, no. She says, we do give tours every Tuesday morning, which you should know. Um, so, you know, if you want a tour, come back on Tuesday morning. And so the doctor sort of plays along, even though she had never heard this before. And she says, oh, okay, great. So the following week, she goes back on the Tuesday morning for the tour and she gets a tour of the Jefferson Institute. And um, it turns out that this place is a place where there are hundreds, maybe over a thousand people who are in a coma and they're being cared for at this facility, which is being billed as like sort of the high tech new wave way to care for people in a coma. Um, and what they do is they suspend them from wires, which are attached to the bones in their body. And they're kept in this room, which is kept like, you know, above room to above body temperature, like, you know, in the nine, in 90 degree, 90 something degrees, very, very warm. And, um, they're basically naked with just like a towel over their midsection and they have a respirator in their mouth and they're being fed by feeding tubes, but they're not even a, in a bed. They're just being suspended from wires, which are literally like screwed into their bones. So it looks very inhuman and they're all in the same room. So you've got all these bodies that are just sort of suspended from wires. And it looks, it looks upsetting at first glance, but it's being billed as the future because it's a very low cost way to care for people who are in a coma. And so there are all these doctors who are being given this tour by this young nurse, and she's explaining to them how this represents the future of taking care of coma victims. So when the tour is over, all of the doctors leave, except for our main character, the young woman doctor, who stays behind because she wants to further investigate the, um, facility. And what she finds out basically is that um, people at the hospital are being intentionally put into comas. Okay, this is the big reveal. So turn this video off now if you don't want it ruined because I'm about to ruin it big time. So it turns out that um, people in this hospital are being intentionally put into comas using carbon monoxide gas. Then they get sent to the Jefferson Institute where they hang on wires for a while until somebody from somewhere around the world in various countries bids on their organs. And all these people who are in comas are basically being used uh, for the um, organ black market. And it's all being done with the knowledge of certain people at the hospital in Boston. So the young doctor figures all this out and she goes back to the chief of surgery and she tells him everything that's going on. 
and um, you know she thinks that she's like blowing the cover of this big ring of um, organ harvesting thieves. And of course, it turns out that the chief of surgery at the hospital is not only in on the whole thing, he's basically running the whole thing. So um, he drugs her and then he uh, gets on the phone and tells everyone at the hospital that she's had a sudden attack and that it's um, she needs to be put into surgery immediately and he's gonna do the surgery himself. And of course, what he's gonna do is he's gonna put her into a coma and send her to the Jefferson Institute. But at the last minute, she manages to convince her boyfriend, Michael Douglas, that there's nothing wrong with her. And of course, he um, saves the day by sort of interrupting the flow of carbon monoxide into her anesthesia. So when her surgery is done, basically she gets an appendectomy that she doesn't even need. And when it's over, she wakes up, which she's not supposed to do because the surgeon who performed the surgery, the head of, the head of surgery at the hospital, was planning on her never waking up. So when she wakes up, he knows that his goose is cooked. And at the very end, there are like basically police at the uh, hospital emergency or the hospital uh, surgery room, the operating room, waiting to arrest the uh, chief of surgery. And that's pretty much how it ends. But it's a really fun thriller if you like this type of movie. And it's a great time capsule because it's 1978. So that you look at the technology in the film, the medical technology, telephones. Um, there's even a scene where she goes to the hospital computer room because she's trying to narrow down, this is when she's trying to narrow down the list of people who have fallen into a coma while they were at this hospital. And she's talking to their computer expert and, she's, and they're showing the computers. And of course, everything is DOS. Everything is, you know, green letters on a black screen and uh, just so crude and, and basic. And it, it's really funny from that perspective, you know, to see this really old fashioned technology. Uh, but anyway, it's a really entertaining film. Um, it is available on my cable on demand system for a pretty cheap rental. So if it's on mine, I'm guessing it's on yours. Um, if you want to see clips of it, I'm sure you could find them on YouTube, but I would recommend watching the whole movie uh, to get the, the full thing. And, and even though I've ruined it for you, I would still recommend seeing it because it's just an interesting film. It's an interesting story. The acting is really good. Um, even though I've ruined the plot for you now, I think it's, it's still a fun story and I would check it out. So anyway, that's it. That's your Friday night movie. Um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel because I'm going to be adding videos from now until the election and beyond. Most of them will be political, but every once in a while I will do something fun like this. So anyway, that's it. That's your Friday night movie. I hope you enjoy. And if you do, if you've ever seen the movie, leave a comment and let me know your thoughts on the film. And if you watch the movie for the first time, then definitely leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts on the film because I really want to know what you thought. That's it. Have a great weekend and happy movie watching.